Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. I'm here with Kyle Stoltzfus again. Now, Kyle, uh, as we all know, there are a lot of challenges that our society is facing, that we're all facing as individuals, that our communities are facing. Uh, what, what is this revealing about our culture, our communities, our, our society? Um, what, what is it going to take for us to come out the other side of all these difficulties? Oh, wow. Uh, th these are really big questions, um, complex ones too. So anything that I, I can offer here, I mean, you're, you're stepping into what's really fragmented territory. It's hard to offer just one simple answer. Um, crises that we're facing, I mean, there's, you have to talk about COVID. Uh, starting off in, in March, it's just a little bit of an awareness of, of uh, pardon, something in the air in Wuhan, and that's, that's early, but we're coming to March, things get serious here in the States. Um, it, could feel, it could feel like there's about maybe one or two weeks in March where there's this, there's this coming together, mm -hmm. this solidarity in yeah. American culture that actually felt kind of good. It's like yeah. There's an unknown threat. We don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to be in this together alone, but together. And then that lasted about two weeks. What I, what I noticed about that crisis, and, and then there's been repercussions, there's been uh, race, uh, really inflammatory conversation about race that's still unresolved and continues to be an issue. Um, what, what, I've, what I've had to notice through my, through my training as, as an ethicist is, is, the, is not so much the crises themselves, but our culture's response to those. And so some of the things that I notice is, is uh, the sorts of resources that are available to a nation in a time of crisis like this. Here, here in America, we're, uh, we're incredibly wealthy. We have the, the, the resource of wealth. We have um, a lot of natural resources. We have a good many allies in other Western cultures who can, who can help us out. There's some mutual exchange happening there. These are, these are all resources that we have. Um, there's the professional resources we have, healthcare, we've got uh, excellent engineers, all of these things that kind of work for us. But what, what I get most interested in are the, the, the social and the ethical resources that are actually available to us. And what I mean, what I mean by that are these, are these large social networks that we have as a country the sorts of bonds that we have with each other that I can say that I know that you've got my back mm -hmm. and that you can say to me that I've got yours as well. And, and, and that, that's a huge resource that in a lot of ways is much more significant than the kinds of resources that we attach to like wealth mm -hmm. or our professionalization or our allies. So there's, there's where I tend to notice these bonds, the social bonds that we have and how those bonds are, are all kind of connected and, and oriented towards some kind of common purpose, okay? So two things that I think this crisis reveals, or the, the COVID crisis, the race crisis, two things that they tend to reveal are, well, first, um, it, uh, it, it calls into question the sorts of resources that we have available to us to rise up and meet at a national level some kind of thing like COVID with solidarity. There's been a lot of fragmentation after those first two glowing weeks or so, things very quickly polarized. And, it, it, and that, it, it happened so quickly. I mean, you could look at the Democrat, Republican pools that this is tend to orient around, the left and the right, you could say, but it, I think it's actually even more complicated than that. Yeah. There's a lot of fragmentation that's revealed. So it, it calls into question the sorts of bonds that we have as a nation. The, the second thing that I'll notice is that the, our response to crises like these have, and this is connected to the first, our response here actually has very little to do with political ideology, uh, whether you're red or blue. Um, what, what I found in my, in my own experience of, of shutdown and things is that it was, it, it, I, I, I was caused more anxiety, right, by the political spectrum and how that conversation was happening at the national level. And what was actually helpful to me were things like sourdough bread, uh, 
roasting and giving out coffee and mm -hmm. receiving gifts and giving gifts to people and actually being available to each other and letting each other that, uh, that we were available. Yeah, so expressions of personal connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the mm -hmm. actual bonds that, yeah. that for me anyway, um, let me know that there's something, something of resource and yeah. substance here. Yeah, I, that, I, that even in this difficult time, I am still part of a community uh -huh. um, that is still there. Yeah. Um, even, even in this, this difficulty where we can't physically be together, uh, the community still exists. Yeah, yeah that's right. And, and, uh, and that community is what I'm saying is what, what actually gave me the resources that I needed, at least, to, to get through a time which is very ambiguous and continues yeah. to be as it develops. Um, it's very ambiguous. It's very kind of open-ended. And the, the, this national discussion about where we should go is, in a lot of ways, just makes things even more ambiguous and was somewhat unhelpful. So I'm calling into question there the sorts of resources we have at the political level to actually meet a challenge like what we've been facing over the last number of months. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting what you said about you don't think that, that these divisions are ideological. It's mm -hmm. not that we've sorted ourselves according to uh, the political or other types of beliefs we have. It, is it maybe almost more that there is an underlying disconnectedness huh. yeah. and that the the polarization, the red team and the blue team, and yeah. all that 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 has not created um, the the disconnectedness so much as it's an expression of it. Uh -huh. Would you say? Well, I think I think you're I think you're onto something that to the level that these local communities have somewhat disintegrated. It's become more difficult to make these sorts of bonds, mm -hmm. but there's also the sense, at least in my experience, where some of what we see, say, really publicized in the, the narratives that are pushed in the political spectrum, in my encounters with everyday people, it just doesn't ring true. Mm. The, the reality is that people tend to be very approachable. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're even open to having tough conversations, mm -hmm. say, about things that matter to us, um, provided that we, we bring the, the sorts of character and virtue we need to have those conversations. So there's something, of a, there's something of an extreme that seems to be painted out, say, in the media that, in my experience on the ground level, it just doesn't, it's not really reflected there very well either. Mm -hmm. You just said something about bringing, um, bringing the, the needed virtue to uh, these difficult conversations that, that we might find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. um, can you say more about that? What, oh. what, is, what is that virtue that we need? Uh -huh. um, where, where, what is it? Where does it come from? Where does that virtue come from? Well, I, I need to back up just a little bit, um, and uh, I, I get the chance here to talk just a little bit about uh, Alistair McIntyre. Okay, I just sprang a name out there. Uh, let me just say why I, why I think he matters. Well, he he offers something of a diagnosis, uh, which I think is it's it's gained a lot of credibility through some of our experiences here in the last number of months and it will probably continue to gain uh, credibility as we go forward. Uh, what, what he does in his book, and he's talking about virtue, he says we're living after virtue. Okay, that's the title of his book. He begins with his allegory of, of a fragmented world that reflects the fragmented moral conversation, the fragmented moral landscape that we're living in, especially as a, a Western post-Christian culture. And he, he gives us this allegory of, of how some kind of catastrophe has come into the world and, and all of the sciences were just suddenly dismantled. And now instead of there actually being a coherent sense of science, all we've got is these fragments. Mm -hmm that are kind of laid out. So uh, we're in the future and we're trying to reassemble these fragments and, and make some kind of coherent science come out of this again. And, and all we've got, say, is, is here's a label from a prescription bottle of Prozac and we've got that. And over here we've got uh, a sixth grader's um, introduction to stargazing with a couple of maps or something like that. And then over here is a page from 1986, National Geographic. And, We've got all this stuff. It introduces us to certain kinds of language, 
and we can kind of pantomime our way into being scientists, but, but the reality is that we're, we're not really doing the discipline of science anymore. It's something else. We're just looking at some disconnected pieces. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and, and if we try to assemble those pieces, it's, it's never going to, it, it, it can't even approximate the whole. It's almost like a parody. Yeah. There's some of the mm -hmm. same language, maybe even a few of the same methods, but it's, mm -hmm. it's lost touch with its overarching goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, we're going to have a really hard time assembling that thing again. And, and what he does with this allegory then, he says, well, that's, that's what science could be like if we imagine that future. But this is the reality of moral or ethical conversation in the United States and in many Western cultures these days. Uh, there's, there's this quote, now I'll just say, he says that this in the actual, or that in the actual world which we inhabit, the language of morality is in the same state of grave disorder as the language of natural science in the imaginary world which I described. So he's, he's talking here about the art of ethics, which is the art of living and discerning and living this, this good life, okay? And he's saying that it's, it's lost its moorings. And because it's lost its moorings, we as a culture just have a really hard time having these moral conversations that we need to have to navigate what are really complex and difficult and painful circumstances. Uh, and that's what it means to live after virtue. Yeah, so it's like we all we have are leftover pieces of good and evil and right and wrong. Yeah. Um, without, uh, without the concept of, of how they truly fit together and with a lot of the pieces missing. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, so we just have these, these disconnected fragments, incomplete fragments um, and they just they just don't go together, and, and because of that, it's, it's it's if you if you can't really have a common picture, if you can't paint on a common landscape with somebody, the best you can do is beat them over the head, <laughs> or get really shrill. Yeah, and then you have people who are really talking right past each other, and uh, <laughs> the intensity of the conversation and the shrillness of it, he's saying, is is just helping them to see like I don't think we're actually having the same conversation yeah. anymore. We've like, just got fragments. Yeah, and taking the fragments and throwing them at each other right. <laughs> instead yeah. of being able to assemble them. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a good example of what you're talking about is seen in, I don't think you can even really call it a debate or a discussion, but the rhetoric uh -huh. around uh -huh. abortion. What really, in, in my mind, I think what, what really is at issue um, with abortion is what is a human being mm -hmm. uh, and under what circumstances, if any, is it permissible to take a human life? Mm -hmm. That is what is, is going to answer the question um, or well maybe a better way to say it is you need to answer those questions. Yes. You know, what is human life? Can human life be taken? Uh -huh. um, you need to answer those questions before you can make any statement about abortion. Uh -huh. um, but I, I, I don't feel like I have noticed any real attempt to have a conversation about those underlying questions. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like instead people, um, people think what they think about what a human being is mm -hmm. and then uh, don't even address that any, any farther than that. Um, and then just put forward their conclusions, uh -huh. uh, throw their conclusions at each other, um, and it, it ends up not even really making sense. Yeah, and, and in many ways, it just kind of galvanizes the opposing viewpoint mm -hmm. many times. They're, 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 they're hammering each other, but all it's doing is strengthening mm -hmm. some of the some of the, the, the opposing view of how they could see as opposing view of the camp that they're in. I, I, I like what you're saying here about some of these fundamental issues, and it, it's, I think it's true that, say, until we have some kind of common understanding of what a human life is and what a human life is good for, until we have some kind of understanding of that, we're never going to be able to actually come together and talk about, say, beginning of life. Is, is abortion ever okay? Or end of life. Or end yeah. of life, mm -hmm. exactly. You know, is euthanasia ever permissible? Yeah. But much less, you know, there's these middle of life things. <laughs> I mean, our... Yeah. Our culture, it's, it's, it's the cult of youth. Yeah. Um, we, love, we love choices. We love resources. 
we love new experiences, and, and, and in a lot of ways, we, we hold this up. The, the call of youth is it's rampant, it's idolatrous. That's what the human good is. It's the accumulation of resources and wealth and of choice, the capacity to be basically like this autonomous individual, yeah. right? Um, there, might be, there might be alternatives to that. <laughs> and I, I should hope so. Yeah. <laughs> oh. well, I'd, 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 I'd suggest here, I think, that, that in the middle of all of this fragmentation that's happening, um, if you're following after McIntyre anyway, there's th the suggestion is it's going to be that the church actually has something to say about these things. The, the, the common moral discourse that we can assume that we're having is in many ways broken down. There's an insolvency in our culture and our ability to actually make moral decisions together. So there's been something of a response to that and saying, yes, that may be true of our culture. You may differ in how thoroughly you agree with McIntyre and folks like that, but the church actually has something to offer us here. The, the, the church is a place where we can, we can pick up the pieces and yeah. restore and, or, and maintain uh -huh. these missing fragments uh -huh. um, and, and assemble um, an account of, of what is really true and what, what good and evil are. Yeah, yeah and, and, and what the church has to offer then to the society that's fragmented and confused is its own integrity, mm -hmm. as in its own account, the true account, the true narrative of what actually makes, say, for example, human life worthwhile. And you can look at Jesus and the, and the dignity of his life and the dignity that he gives to the people around him, to children, to the aged, to the people outlined to the community, to the people in the community. Uh, for him, it's, it's all very much the same. It takes him to the cross, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we actually have that to offer. Mm -hmm. And that's something that our culture today and even though you have some really abstract notion of, say, human dignity and mm -hmm. human rights. And self-sacrifice and things like those, that. Those can be kind yeah. of noble sometimes, yeah. but they've been distorted in a way that's hardly even recognizable as Christian mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that the church actually has to offer, a much stronger basis mm -hmm. for what human dignity means. Right. But it's based in Christ. Yes. Not just this yeah. general notion of these truths are self-evident. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the church, the church can offer a basis for um, for belief and for action mm -hmm. uh, that's that's not rooted in myself, right? Um, yeah. and my and my own implicit rights. Yes, say. yeah, and uh, and my own authority to to do what I decide is good for me. Uh -huh. um, but instead, to uh, to hold up and follow the example of Jesus, who made himself of no reputation, like it says in the book of Philippians, mm -hmm. um, and took the form of a servant on himself. Mm -hmm. um, when, when he, of all people, <laughs> had every right uh, to autonomy mm -hmm. um, and to, uh, to be exalted. Mm -hmm. it, it takes tremendous courage to try to live that way mm -hmm. in this world. I mean, we'd, we'd much rather, I think, find refuge in either our own inherent rights which is where many folks go, I have my rights, and if, if that's all you've got, you're going to hang on to those pretty hard. Mm -hmm. But to live in that self-abased, self-giving way that could possibly lead to the cross, yeah, right? Yeah. It takes tremendous courage, and mm -hmm. you've got to draw on resources that are, that are broader than just me as an individual. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick up the trail a little bit further with McIntyre. Yeah, you know, it's just kind of like Please. talking about McIntyre. Yeah. Um, but what I found is that uh, there's, there's an entire branch of ethics that's being erected and that's, that's, that's growing in some of its influence that's, that's, drawing, in, that's drawing inspiration both from, from men like McIntyre who say there's, there's something wrong in our society. We need to return to other ways of understanding doing ethics and community and what that's like. So the drawing inspiration from McIntyre, the they're drawing inspiration from the Anabaptist tradition as well. Uh, this is what Samuel Wells, the, the Christian ethicist, he calls this tradition ecclesial ethics. Okay, and it's it's an approach. An ethics, um, an ethics of the church. Yeah. In other words, an ethics by yeah. and for the church, and that's that's how the church is actually doing its ethical work is by being the church. That doesn't mean to be ingrown. It's it's missional, but. Its integrity is found in the claims that are peculiar to the church itself. 
Um, and it, it's, it's just an approach to, to doing ethics, an approach to choosing and living the good life that emphasized that the church gives her best to society by simply being the church. Okay? Uh, and it means, in other words, that the church has her own integrity. She has her own practices. She has her own texts, scripture being one of the really significant of those texts, right? She has her own sources of authority. She has her own heroes, her own stories, her own traditions. And some of these are, as the culture continues to go, it's fragmented and atomized and increasingly tribal way. Uh, the difference of some of these things that are peculiar to the church is going to become more and more apparent. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think here, as, um, as Christians become increasingly aware and increasingly recognize that we're living in this post-Christian culture, and as some of the pretenses of our unity are stripped away by crises like we're going through right now, as that becomes increasingly apparent, um, this, this approach to ethics of ecclesioethics is gaining more traction. Mm -hmm. So it's like I tell my, my students in uh, the ethics class that I teach here, like this is a really interesting time to be an Anabaptist. Uh, or some of the, the formal alliances between church and state are, are deteriorated. Cultures increasingly go in a direction that many Christians are, are leery of. And by and large, is Christianity, at least in a lot of well, Roman Catholic and the, the main Protestant, um, <coughs> kind of the leading Protestant circles, as that's in decline, mm -hmm. there's just a growing awareness like, whoa, we need to think about other ways of doing church. And there's been that turn toward a more ecclesial approach. So there's this fragmentation that's becoming more and more apparent. And uh, I think some of what you're saying is that um, the, the Anabaptist point of view uh -huh. that always did see um, a, an underlying fundamental break between the church and the rest of society, mm -hmm. um, that, that break that we have always seen was kind of papered over, or mm -hmm. it was... Um, it was masked. I hate to bring up masks right now, but anyhow, <laughs> um, <coughs> in the past, uh, <coughs> by, by a, what, what we would have always considered as Anabaptists to be an artificial um, union of the church and the rest of society. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, that's being shown to have, been, um, to have been false in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the, the, the times that we're living in um, and I think if you read the barometer, the times that we're going to continue to live in, and maybe increasingly so, there are times that are there. There are times that can kind of suit the hand mm. of of what we've traditionally, the place we've traditionally tried to hold in society as as the Anabaptists, which is to say, well, culture does things that are unpredictable and, mm. and savage and chaotic. That's what you'd expect of a culture that's out and doing its cultural thing. Yeah, it's, it's like what, uh, what James says uh -huh. about the wisdom that is of this world versus the wisdom that is from above. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. that's right. And, yeah, and, 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 and to be born into this community, uh, to be reborn into it, uh, to be baptized into it is, is to begin to live in a, in a different mode of life. But it's not just expected. There, there's, something, there's something about the church's approach to this, which isn't just intuitive. Mm. As in, it's not just something that every reasonable person <laughs> is just going yeah. to be able to be persuaded. You actually have to die. Yeah, you yeah. have to die to yourself. And Take enter up your cross. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, and, and by entering this, you know, you're, 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 you're kind of sowing yourself like that kernel of wheat mm, that's mm -hmm. going to die and then something sprouts but but these are not intuitive ways mm -hmm. of influencing a culture yeah and and they need to be entered into by choice and they need mm -hmm. to be decided and committed to when we take up that cross um, it's the cross that the Lord gives us and it's mm -hmm. it's peculiar to us and to join into a body of cross bearers isn't something that just everybody's going to want to do mm. um, so I think I'm not sure if I want to do it. No, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> no, that, I, that's right. Yeah, e even, even though it, I, I know I should, I know yeah, it's right. And, and this is important. Yeah. I mean, you could you could become 
hopelessly idealistic and just say like, well, in this bubble, we're going to get it. Mm -hmm. But the reality, I mean, the cross penetrates all the way through the church as well. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of cross bearing to do within the community of believers. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not just something we get to decide and hold up as a standard mm -hmm. and say, well, this is a cross-bearing community and that one's not. Um, it, I mean, that's, that's the way of the Lord with us. Mm. But there has been that sensibility in Anabaptism just not to expect the world mm -hmm. to behave in ways that would make it just, just an extension of the church. Yes. It's mm -hmm. like there's, there's something of a disconnect there. And as our culture continues to move in the direction that it has, there's at least a growing appreciation in mm -hmm. my experience for the contributions of Anabaptist traditions. Yeah, um, you're saying um, an appreciation among other Christians that are outside of our own Anabaptist tradition. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. Uh, so it's, they, there's obviously there's always questions, yeah. there's reservations, mm -hmm. but at least a certain respect mm -hmm. and um, sometimes a kind of solidarity of saying, you, you all have something to contribute here. We want to hear what you have to say. Hmm. Um, and an appreciation for some of the riches that the Anabaptist heritage of, say, nonviolence and of a kind of community that's pretty tightly integrated hmm. and it has some resources to resist some hmm. of the woos of the culture that hmm. we live in right now. And they're recognizing you all have something to say to us. Hmm. And they, they, they have some things to say to us too, I think. But uh, in my experience, that the conversation isn't just one direction anymore. Hmm. There's a lot of Christians realizing that uh, they need something more. Hmm. I, I think we, we have to recognize that it's, it's become more and more clear that there's, there's just a lot of confusion these days hmm. about uh, what we even mean when we talk about something like a common good, hmm. some kind of national fireplace that we can all kind of gather around yeah. and we're making our s'mores together. <laughs> We're mm. not actually even sure what that common good is like. We're not sure if we even want to do that. No, you know, actually, yeah. we're not. We're not anymore. And as things get more more tribalistic mm. and militaristic, even that, it seems less likely. We're mm. not. It's not just the campfire to gather and say kumbaya, um, because the fact is, there's 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 a lot of goods mm. being sought in our culture. There's a lot of smaller interest groups and, and fragments that are out there and they're, they're seeking their own goods. So what we're, what we're witnessing today is, is a disagreement about those goods. Yeah. And they're, they're not lining up very well, they're not mm -hmm. very common. And in an environment like what we have, I mean, anybody who, who, who talks about the common good, I mean, increasingly it just feels nostalgic. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what that actually means. Yeah, is that like, like something from the good old days that may or may not even have existed? Even then, yeah, yeah. even then, I'm not sure, but there, 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 there have been resources, at least as an American culture we had in the past, that it, it felt good to say the common good, mm. and I think there was more to it. Now mm. there's just yeah. less. Yeah. It's almost incoherent. Yeah. We don't even understand what that means, except I guess mm. maybe the common good is that it's mine. Mm. You know, it's my good, and, and mm. I get to pursue that. And that. yeah, and if you don't recognize that what's good for me is what's good for all of us, then that's obviously your problem. Typically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they may have to hammer you over the head to, to help you, to help convince you that my good yep. is actually your good as mm. well. Um, for the rhetoric is getting real inflammatory mm. and shrill. So uh, what I'm suggesting here, I think, just to put this in a nutshell, is that as we have less clarity of, of the supposed common good, there's, there's just going to be continued interest in the church pursuing its own goods, mm. its, its own traditions, developing its own practices, continuing to, to, uh, to challenge itself mm. and its culture with the heroes and the texts and the stories the commitments, the beliefs, all of this stuff that comes together and gives the church as its body, its integrity, there's going to just be continued to be more and more attention given to that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, and when, when people join the church, increasingly I think it's just going to be apparent that it's, it's not just through coercing people mm -hmm. through some kind of program of like political ideology, but it's through baptism. Yes. That's how people join themselves to mm -hmm. this body. Yeah, the, uh, the, the choices that they're making um, to, to join themselves to the church uh -huh. and not the church exercising power 
um, in a carnal way over right. others. Uh huh. Yeah. Which you know that kind of it brings me to something I was sort of thinking. What what can we do to make sure that we are that we are standing apart and offering an alternative mm -hmm. as opposed to engaging in in a struggle uh -huh. uh, that we that we hope to win in a in a carnal way. Mm -hmm. Well, great question. And I think if I'm hearing the question right, there's the two possible responses. Uh, the, the one response might be to retreat so far into some kind of Christian tribe mm -hmm. that you, you harden the boundaries mm -hmm. and you just internalize the resources and, and you refuse to allow access to people outside who may be in desperate need of some of those resources, I'm yeah. social resources we have. The ability just to have a conversation mm -hmm. with somebody. To, to the point where we're not offering an alternative. It's like we're on another planet that no one else can <laughs> even get to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my kingdom is not of this world, right? Well, so yeah. we might as well just go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's quite what Jesus meant. No, I don't think yeah. he did. Anyhow. I don't think it means we have to move to Mars yeah. necessarily. No, not. Um, I mean, it does mean we have to have our own integrity yeah. as, yeah. as, a, as mm -hmm. kind of a counter witness to the yeah. fragmentation that our world is in. Or else our, 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 excuse me, or else our alternative isn't even an alternative anymore. It loses its saltiness. It, yeah, yeah. 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 So we, we do need to maintain that, that alternative, but I'm, I'm saying I don't think we need to just build a ghetto mm -hmm. off yeah. to the side of the culture somewhere and, and retreat into that. Mm -hmm. Need those resources, okay? Hear me right. We need to preserve our own integrity, and, and our Lord actually, he encourages us to do that, mm -hmm. okay? But that the purpose of that isn't just for the sake of its own integrity. Yeah, yeah. The purpose of it is to have a, a kind of a certain porousness on the boundaries mm -hmm. so that we can be extending the resources into our culture and also winsomely inviting them in. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I'd just suggest is that... Um, uh, you know, Jesus tells us, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. And in a culture that's shrill, that's really kind of baseless and in many ways adrift, um, and it's unable to have the difficult conversations that it needs to have, uh, I think there's just going to be a continued space for there to be peacemakers. Mm -hmm. People who can actually have the virtues they need to have tough conversations with people who have opposing viewpoints to themselves but who can also kind of get in the thick of things sometimes mm. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and adjudicate differences, which are just helping people to understand mm. where they're coming from without just having this huge bias toward their own interests, mm. right? That's something that Christians can do. Yeah, so to paradoxically, perhaps, to enter a conflict as peacemakers. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. <laughs> that is a kind of a paradox, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Uh, to, to engage, not, not just to be present, but to engage in conflict as peacemakers. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for what you shared. Uh, it offers healthy challenge to all of us uh, to, to be part of the church as, as God intended for us to be uh, as his ambassadors in this world. Hmm. Thank, thank you, you. Peter.